very appropriate to the question of how do we speed up social awareness. The key word in all this is not speed and not up and not even awareness. It really is social. India is a very good place where this topic is a constant challenge. Because while it is maybe the biggest reservoir of social issues at this point in time, this has not always been the case in human history. And there is no objective imperative that this could not be reversed to be a totally different thing. There are very many advantages to Indian society. The one is that in my view, what characterizes, what represents India best is a village. It's not the Bombay Stock Exchange. It is not foreign direct investment. It is not the centrality of central government. Every village is a world to itself. Most villagers have never been to Delhi, don't even think of Delhi, have never touched a 500 rupee note. And yet their life goes on, They're born, they live, they will die in a totally different set of concepts, circumstances, quantums. So if we wanted to do something social at that context, I think that there are four issues that give us a very good anchor to where we can actually breed success and speed up social, not only awareness, but also social outcomes. The first is, we need to think community and not individual. This, the mindset, as I have encountered it many, many times in India, is that most financial decisions are not described by what the economists call the homo economicus, the rational thinker. They are much more characterized by a very prominent, a very urgent concern that people exercise how not to be different from their reference group. Their reference group is their social security, is their support is their emotional support, their <laughs> physical support, their financial support. So nobody is willing to take the risk of going against the group. So no matter what I think as an individual about a certain enterprise or about a certain proposition or about a, the values of some transaction, ultimately What is more important is not how good that transaction may be, but how my reference community positions itself towards this transaction. My example is insurance, not very well known in India. If everybody around me says, this is crazy, we don't do it. Even if I'm totally convinced that this is very good, I will probably not do it. And if I do it, I'll be very, very careful. Now, if everybody around me says, this is the greatest thing and we all do it and this is what a responsible adult should do, I'll do it even if I'm not convinced. Because I consider myself a responsible adult like everyone else. What I'm trying to say here is this. In the chaos of the Indian rural society, which has permeated also the informal sector, which is no longer truly rural, but it's still rural in its mindset. What matters most is what my group would do. What matters most is, God forbid, I should not be excommunicated from my group, because that's the worst punishment I can imagine. Nothing is worse than that. I can't take that risk, I won't do it. So that is the first issue. We need to think collective and not individual. Anybody who tries to sell a product to an individual on a one-to-one -one transaction is in the wrong country in India. Forget it. And it makes no difference if it is through internet or face-to-face -face or anything else. The 
the collective permeates the mindset, the thinking, the, the financial decisions, and even if people are deviant on it, it comes back to roost the next day, the next week, or in other contexts. So that's number one. Number two, the world has become more complicated everywhere. The amount of transactions we are obliged to take in a lifetime have become very sophisticated. It is no longer just a question of save or not save, spend or not spend. Most of the things require a long time dimension. Not one season, but multiple seasons. Last year's rain influenced this year's crops. So when I'm a farmer, I don't only look if this year's monsoon is on time. I remember how it was last year even though the Indian Meteorological Society is not going to publish it, but it is critical to my crop and I know it. And I asked the other old people in the village because they also remember how it was 10 years ago. And that matters to me when I sow. And what seeds I will buy, are they going to be modern seeds, more expensive, more high risk, or am I going to buy the traditional seeds, which will give lower yield, but are lower risk? So, permeating almost all our decisions are dimensions of multiple periods, not a single year or a single event or a single encounter, and the collective memory and the collective experience of very many things, people, events. That requires a different kind of education. If I had to address that issue in the context of your question, Priya, I would say, when children start school, maybe in parallel to starting to learn to read and write, they should learn insurance education, financial education. We have seen in villages that girls taught their mothers because they were taught more in school. And the mothers trusted the girls. So the decisions were taken not so much by what the mothers thought, but what the, what the daughters, and the, maybe mainly the daughters, and the, and the sons, recommended to the older generation to do. So insurance education, or if you wish, financial literacy in a more uh, generalized manner. And I do not talk here about the provider side. I do not talk here about the supply side. I'm talking about educating everybody, consumers, to be savvy consumers in a complicated society. The third is, that the social structure of governance in India has made it very typical that people are afraid of authority. They're not only afraid that authority will come to me and tell me today to do this or not to do that. They're also afraid to engage in anything new lest somebody will come next month or at some other time and say, ah, you should have known, this was not right, this was not quite within the rules, now I'll punish you later. And because of the context of corruption, which I'm sorry to raise here, but is relevant, sometimes when people reject one thing, they're being hit with some kind of a different riot act. So this is why people are very risk averse and very conservative. For that, to overcome that and accelerate social awareness to the benefits of different things, we need a stamp of approval of a sort. We don't need government money. We don't need government regulation. <coughs> we don't even want it. But we do need some kind of a formulation which says what you do there in your group, in your community, in your village, it's okay. Nobody's coming to tell you that this was illegal, immoral, dangerous, or who knows when it will hit you. And the last thing is that everything that we do needs money. There is no shortage of money even in rural India. But the biggest mediator of money are not venture capitalists, neither in Mumbai nor in the United States. It is the money lenders. They control the financial availability for most Indians for most occasions. 
and their technology is much more advanced than the technology of all the others. What is it? Human contact. They don't rely on a telephone or an application. They visit every single day. Administrative costs are close to zero. Reliability, 100%. And they have invented the most effective collateral that functions in Indian society. Social collateral, not asset. The family is responsible for the transaction. So, in the Western mindset, I sign a loan, I'm responsible for that loan. In the Indian, at least rural mindset, I take a loan. If I fall sick, it's my family that will have to pay for it. This is how you see in Delhi ultra poor people cycling with white goods that they will never be able to afford. You know, refrigerators, washing machines and whatnot. Why don't they run away with it? Because their family is the social collateral to the man who hired them to do it. And they are not going to put that at risk. And this exists throughout society in India. So David, um, from, from those four metrics that you've mentioned, I would just like to move uh, further into the conversation uh, stemming from what you said, because it's, it's a good segue into some of our other panel members. Um, I would like to go to Mr. Riaz actually next, uh, because what a bit of what Dr. David touched upon. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce you, and then maybe we can talk a bit about that. So Mr. Riaz Merchant is with us. He is guiding the Rizwan Adeta Foundation as a Chief Operating Officer. Riaz is an engineering graduate with a postgraduate degree in business administration. He has worked in various multinationals at different managerial positions and currently he is based in Mozambique where he has been living for the last 20 years, uh, spanning an expertise in healthcare, education and livelihood, uh, spanning six countries including Madagascar, South Africa and Bangladesh. So Riaz coming from a foundation perspective. Uh, today, the, the topic is about how can uh, traditional firms or big corporates develop their response to social awareness and how can they accelerate um, how they are dealing with policies such as the CSR policy that is out there. So like Dr. David said, there is a lot of money available, but a lot of corporates and a lot of organizations are struggling where the money should be put. So I think you have some thoughts regarding how can joint venture partnerships help us or help the corporates and the traditional firms achieve the goal of becoming socially aware at a, a sped up pace. So we'd love to hear a few minutes of your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, as the topic suggests here that entrepreneurs as well as managers <coughs> in traditional firms need to develop their response to equality, inclusiveness in CSR. That's the first, first area that there is a need of urgency as our learned colleague has mentioned now and also Priya in, his, in her opening remarks said the difference, the wide gap between the need and also the, the, the provision or availability of the funds and the resources. So there is a dire need for an urgent response. And second, as we say that how can they do it effectively when developing their business quickly. Now here I would go back to the definition of the traditional firms as the topic suggests here as the organization represents the organizational structure in a business is hierarchical, meaning power flows vertically and employees are departmentalized. All employees follow a chain of command, such as manager is the chief coordinator of all departments. Now these traditional firms, when they think, and I would like to also bring about this 2% uh, uh, social so, uh, CSI component with the, the firms are obliged to contribute. So then they, they are basically focused towards their business in their myopic approach or sometimes they don't even have time and priority to look for how they can use and utilize these funds. And there where a joint venture partner can, can uh, fit in and this is what we have been doing in India whereby you know the, the, we contact or, or we have been approached by the traditional firms or medium sized firms and they say that look we have got funds available but we don't have the time or the appetite in terms of going into deep uh, details, finding research, finding out. We don't have other, we would like to use that for that time and resource for developing our business. So why don't you take care of that? 
and then based on their interest in the thematic areas either education health or livelihood mm -hmm. then we provide them the the data engage them jointly combine uh, form the strategy and after that budgets and then the timeline to for an implementation plan mm -hmm. and then you know we can involve them we involve them in during thing and i would like to say that we have been successfully doing that in india Mozambique in Africa and also the DRC and with our uh, partners in Bangladesh, South Africa and Madagascar. And I would like to just mention uh, as a conclusion that we have been working in the states of Gujarat, Maharashtra, Goa, New Delhi, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Jharkhand, Odisha and Telangana in the areas of education, livelihood and health, one way or another directly or with the help or cooperation of one of our partner partners. Thank you uh, for those remarks and uh, that brings us to creating um, more of an, so going from traditional firms to entrepreneurs uh, and I, we have with us on the panel Mr. Peter Lazu and he is a future venture builder and an investor with the passion for creating <coughs> stories that bring alive the power of tech startups and sustainable inclusive ecosystems from all corners of the earth. He has designed groundbreaking and award-winning technologies with three successful exits in fintech, automotive, IoT, wearables and gaming across four continents. Uh, Mr. Peter is also behind the Other Dots Foundation, which is the first ever social impact fund on based on blockchain to provide digital identity and voice to the unbanked while also improving human conditions across rural areas in emerging countries. He is also a firm believer of the fact and the idea that entrepreneurs cannot be made and that the urge uh, needed to be one cannot be taught. So, Peter, how do we get around to building an entrepreneurial ecosystem. Being an entrepreneur myself and having started a social enterprise, I see that there is a lot of gap between entrepreneurs who want to start businesses with a social focus. So what is needed to build that ecosystem? And what is the entrepreneur's perspective and what is the investor's perspective when people are in doing any kind of impact investing? Okay, <clears throat> well, uh, firstly, thank you for, uh, for having me here. Uh, thanks everyone for, for turning up. Um, I, I guess I'm going to spin it a little bit just to begin with because I think, um, as, as I always say, I think we're living in an entrepreneurial world, but we're also living in a startup bubble. Um, for those who remember the dot com era, it's very similar, okay, for me, in my opinion. Because everyone today is an entrepreneur, everyone is a serial entrepreneur, uh, everyone is a, a startup, everyone's an investor and everyone's a, a mentor. So we, we, we've got all these buzzwords that are flying around absolutely everywhere. And for me, um, the definition of what is an entrepreneur or a startup um, has become very diluted. Um, and um, it, it's, it's become, if you like, distracted to what really it's all about. Um, and, you know, the question for me is, you know, when, when I hear founders who say, you know, when I ask them, so what are you doing? And they turn around and say, well, we just set up this new marketing company. It's a startup to do this. And all of a sudden, and then, then we have consultancy companies who are also startups. And it begs to determine whether they really understand what it really means. Because a marketing company, a consultancy company um, are not startups, okay? These are proven things that are out there in the world today. So the question is, you know, what is a startup? Okay. So I always question that. Um, so the question, the key question for me is, if someone, you know, if someone asks me to, to you know, to to give them some advice, the first thing I'll say to them is, what is it? What is your purpose? What? Why did you wake up to do what you're doing? That's number one criteria for me. Um, and it's really, really important because everyone assumes they want to solve a problem. And there may not be a problem. There may be a gap in the opportunity, there may be a gap, there may be a potential opportunity. So when you're trying to do something, the question is to me is, what are you trying to achieve? Are you going to make an impact in the world? And are you going to create jobs? Okay? Making money should be the last thing on your mind, because that's not what an entrepreneur is about. And, and forget this thing about, I want to become an entrepreneur because I want to make millions. No, because 95% of startups fail. Okay? Um, so it, it's, for me, that's really, really, really important. So, you know, and then we have the definition of what is success. So, so now I'm going to come back to, to the question, which is, what do we need to make all this happen? Well, um, for sure, you know, in, in a country like India, for example, we do need uh, the government's, uh, if you like, support um, in a number of ways. 
Um, you know, ideally what you want to be able to do is, is create a playground where amazing entrepreneurs, aspiring entrepreneurs can go and play with ideas. Um, and that's their, their, think of it as like a room like this, a virtual environment where it's safe. Meaning whatever you do in this environment, you can test, you can um, play around, make mistakes, but then when you go out into the real world, you know it's going to work in some shape or form. So for me, that's a, a great one. But also, again, coming back to what you said about having access to money is, is an important one. Um, but it's also it's, it's access to grants, funds to help you in this playground to do what you need to do. Um, I think universities play another important role because, um, again, what I've been seeing, you know, traveling around literally everywhere around the world, is that students today who are about to graduate not necessarily want to go into a corporate world. They want to participate in um, the big picture, meaning, you know, us, unfortunately, us lot, me, you, maybe because we're a bit older, <laughs> but we, we're being blamed for the crap that's happened in the world today, unfortunately. Um, and so, you know, they want to make a change. So, you know, you guys don't know what you're doing, but we're going to come in and we want to try and solve it. And I think it's really great that we've got, you know, the, if you like, the, 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 um, the, the what was it, the, the Gen Z, as we call them now, Generation Z, yeah, um, who want to come out of university, don't want to become doctors, accountants, but want to do something different to be able to, to make a change. Um, so, again, um, for me, it's also about creating environments where people can innovate, um, and also, we need to take, take um, uh, if you like, the opportunity to have mentors, but mentors who've seen it and done it, okay? You need to have mentors who literally have made a lot of money, lost a lot of money, okay? Um, but really understand what it means to take a company from an idea all the way through to making it a success. Um, and again, too many times I see today, you know, these aspiring young entrepreneurs who have set up a company, they've raised some money, and all of a sudden now they're going to go and mentor some other people. And they really don't know what they're mentoring on. So if we're going to build an ecosystem of entrepreneurs, we really need to go back to the foundation to really understand what is it that we're trying to do here. So and I think some things we, we've got here. Um, so I've also got here that, um, um, you know, Going back to now to the social side of things is all of a sudden we're also seeing both entrepreneurs and investors now focusing on the SDGs. Okay, I think it's great what the United Nations have done. Um, the time scale is just too short. Which we've got 10 years to save the world, which is not going to happen. We're about three or four trillion still out of pocket to, to achieve it. Um, but the point is now every startup I come across now is an SDG. It's doing something for SDGs. Okay. We also have investors now who are now impact investing. Again, I challenge it. Okay. Do they really understand what it all means? All right. I think it's great that we can go back um, and, uh, and have the social side because the foundation that I have in the UK, it really is about going into real rural areas of the world. It's about picking up those people who don't have an opportunity, who don't have a digital identity and don't have a voice. And we bring them into the middle, and then we take the opportunity from universities, those graduates who want to find jobs, looking for jobs, first time, second time entrepreneurs, we bring them in the middle, we merge their mindsets and their cultures to build startups from ground zeroes, but with the focus of going back into those rural areas and solving the real problems that are happening. Because again, we are too, I guess, too eager to believe that we can solve a problem. Um, and I'll share a real quick little real good story. Um, and there was a, 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 a US company who um, decided that this village in Africa, and I, I have to remember what the village was, but this village in Africa, they decided that they needed to change their whole urinal system, their whole toilet system, okay? So they went and built this, this really you know, you know, modern toilet system, parked it into the village, um, and they were baffled as to why it wasn't working. Um, and they asked the question, why, why is no one using the toilet? Why are you still going and doing what you're normally doing? And they said, because what you haven't realised and what you didn't ask was why we go, why we don't want people to know what we're doing. They don't want you to know that I'm about, when I open that door, I'm going to go and have a pee and a poo. I don't want you to know that. So they got the whole concept wrong. What they should have done is gone in there to understand what was needed and then together build it. And that's what we're trying to do with our foundation, which we will fund all the way. So I hope I'm, I'm trying to answer the, the, the question. So I think yes. even now from an investor's perspective, um, I think I guess the investors are also understanding that 
you know, we now have to look at impact. We now need to need to, to look. So I, 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 the way I look at investing, and I'll do it from my own perspective, is my foundation, as we're investing in all these startups that we're creating, it's all about creating a, a double, triple bottom line. And a double, triple bottom line means this. It means that, number one, for sure, we want to give a good return of, of investment to our investors who invest in our fund. Absolutely. But secondly, we want to make sure, or, or actually first, we want to make sure that whatever we're building is going to make an impact in the world and really change what needs to be happening in these communities. And third, we want to create jobs. Jobs on both sides, both in the communities that really need it, but also jobs from universities, etc. So the employment there. So I think, you know, I guess in a, in a bit of a nutshell, that's what we're, you know, that, that's what I believe it's needed to get things Thank done. Thank you, uh, Peter. And um, I do believe that in the audience today, we'll, we'll ask probably everyone to raise their hands after this. How many people are firms? How many people are investors? How many people belong to which sector? So we have an idea of the mix in the room. Uh, but before we get to that, uh, I would like to get to our panelist, uh, Dr. Patricia. So she is the CEO of BirdLife International, which is a global partnership of conservation organizations that strives to conserve birds, their habitats, and global biodiversity. And she's working with people towards sustainability in the use of natural resources. She's an outstanding conservationist with a strong track record of delivering global scale conservation at the local level. She is the first woman from the developing world to lead an international conservation organization. I was happy to learn about that. And today, I think, um, Patricia, what we would love to hear from you is how can, you know, I don't want to call them traditional organizations, but that seems to be the word in our brochure here today. But how can firms, big firms, start to think socially aware and how can they incorporate environmental responsibility in their value chain from an end-to-end -end perspective. How does that work? Thank you, Bria. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me here. I was a little bit feeling the odd out uh, in the mix because coming from the conservation world, surrounded by entrepreneurs and private sector companies is kind of like a different um, scenario from what we normally are used to. Uh, but I welcome very much the opportunity because this is precisely the place where we can change things. Uh, starting with the point of social awareness, I think one of the things that we have to remember, whether it is in the rural areas in India or the indigenous communities in the Amazon or the traditional people in any of the cities, whether it is London or New York, there is an, a, a higher level of social awareness of environmental issues on the planet right now. And whether it is because of the Greta Thunbergs in, in Sweden or because it is of the impact of climate change that we're seeing already or because it is in the news and there are denials, uh, from presidents, from big nations like the United States to others, <laughs> I think it is something that it, there's the buzz about knowing that there's something wrong with the environment and that we have to do something about it. So that element of social awareness, I think, is already there. And I think some of you already mentioned the, the role of the youth and them wanting to, to make a change, um, whether it is because they're looking at the weather to 10 years ago and because they're trying to figure out what the future is going to look like or because they are coming from universities and they do want to have an impact and make a change. I, when I see um, private sector involved in environment and I see you know, the great progress that India has done with the 2% on the CSR, I definitely believe that is a step in the right direction but not near what we need right now. I mean, CSR has over the years been a, an element that is on the sidelines of the traditional business. It's not mainstream. It's the nice thing that we're doing on the sides if we are actually having nice profits. It's not our part of our business and understanding really that we have a role to play because we're part of a bigger system and that we are having an impact on whatever we do, whether it is insurance or mining, we are having an impact on the planet right now. So while, it, while, while the policy is a really good step in the right direction, I think there is a, an, an element and a bigger step that we have to take as entrepreneurs, as, as private sector, of understanding that we have to move from CSR to mainstreaming ESG. And when we are mainstreaming ESG, we are concentrating traditionally on the social and the governance because that's the bread and butter and that's what we understand better. And when we try to do the E of the ESG, we 
traditionally go to climate change because it's the easier thing to measure. And I understand that we from the conservation community have not been making it easier for the private sector to actually report on the E much more um, um, impactfully uh, and with better numbers. But we have to understand that the planet is living a, a very big crisis of nature loss. The, the farmers in India are seeing it. The people in Bombay are seeing it. The monsoons that are coming right now I, I, and, and the people feeling them are seeing them. There is a crisis going on and there's a system that is out of balance and we need to start working on it. And why does this matter? I mean, I think it is important to remember that if we want to have a change, we want, want to understand what is what we're changing. What is the problem? You know, and if, what are we trying to change here? And I think it is understanding that the human species is just one species of the rest of the species in a system that has to be in balance. So whatever impact investment we're trying to do, we have to start considering that environment is a central point of what we are trying to do and mainstreaming it is going to be the, 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 the path to making a change. <coughs> so I think it is, um, it's, it's still something that is nascent, is exciting to see that it's starting to become part of the discussion. I was extremely proud of being in Davos this year and seeing so much talk about sustainability. I know that the sustainable development goals seem like a, a very impossible task to have. I mean, I think I've seen just a couple of these around, but at least I'm seeing them, which is really exciting. Uh, but I think it, there is a change and a move that is happening right now. What we need to do is start harnessing it and mainstreaming it. So when we are thinking about the next startup, the next enterprise, the next company, the next action, it is truly embedding that element of understanding what is my impact, what, is, what can I do better to not only avoid impact, negative impact on the environment, but have a positive um, impact on, on what is surrounding us and what it would be the sustainability for tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, so today, uh, the way we wanted the session to be, uh, we have approximately 40 more minutes for the session. So I really wanted the audience to be more a part of the panel than the panel talking to the audience. So I would just like to flip the entire session onto the audience. So just imagine that all of you are the panelists to this audience uh, and, and we are the audience for example and so how many first of all in the audience how many of us here represent so-called traditional firms can we have a couple of hands what? traditional Firm. firms firms, firms. firms. Uh, big firms big companies, corporate companies, companies. like a private company <laughs> any private so companies here firm. <laughs> oh, yeah there's one there's two there's three four not okay we have we have four companies here five not my current but like the previous company okay so we have five private companies uh, which i'm sure are still thinking about how to talk about CSR or how to start their social awareness trajectory. What about foundations or not-for-profit NGOs? How many of us are from that sector? Social enterprise. Social enterprise. That's also about... Okay. That's about five. Okay. And I would love to know uh, the other people in the audience. So what industries do you come from? And so... I'm a VC. Oh, yes. Amazing. So we have investors. Any more investors in the audience? Oh, wow. We have more investors. Also an investor. All right. And uh, any other industries, any other people we've missed out to bifurcate? Education. Education from a private company? Yes. Okay, private company. All right. Education. Education as well. Okay. Yes, we have two. So I think what, what we can do is uh, how we in initially intended for uh, the group discussion to happen is that we wanted to have, uh, you know, traditional firms, big corporate firms, not traditional firms, uh, you know, sort of gravitate towards one topic. Uh, and we wanted to have people from the impact investing space in another topic. Anybody here who is more interested in, for example, talking about the entire end-to-end -end value chain? regarding environment and sustainability explain you're all interested okay so then uh, so then what we're going to do is we'll open up the floor now that we have sort of a bifurcation of everybody and i would like to invite a few of you to sort of be a part of the panel 
and start the discussion. Um, and I would like one of you to probably volunteer from the audience to start the open floor discussion. I'd like to give it a try, if you yes, don't mind. Of course, of I'm not sure I'm on track. And yes. Please, your, please do introduce your, yourself. Your and model is interesting. Yes. My name is Frank Wisner. <clears throat> I work with a law firm in the United States. I helped establish American insurance tie-ups in India, but not at the micro level. Uh, so a variety of non-relevant experiences. So I have a question because I'm, I'm trying to understand from the general to the particular what we're talking about. So I'm going to start, if it's all right, with you, Mr. Drawer, and ask you the starting micro insurance in rural areas in India. Uh, can you walk us through? What actually has to happen? Do you have to go to the IRDA? Uh, how do you set up loss-making uh, records? How do you have access to losses? How do you pay uh, claims? How do you manage costs? What profit expectations should you expect from the enterprise you're getting into? How do you distribute this information to the rural population that you're doing. Give me a, a practical sense of who you are and what you do. Sorry, before you, before you answer, I would also like to say that this question, if anybody else from the audience wants to answer the same question, please feel free to join in the conversation after the event. So, in a nutshell, you'd like to know the business process of my grandchildren's. The beginning has to always be local, with a group of people. Nine times out of ten, it was not a group of people, anonymous. It was a group of women. Yes. And the way to, and children who tagged on, but the players with women. And the way we actually started the dialogue was not about preaching about insurance models, underwriting, and all the rest of it. We collected the kids together <coughs> and asked them if they knew what was insurance. Of course, we anticipated the answer would be no, but for kids it's easier to say no, I don't know, than for adults. And then we simply, in their own language and in a playful way said to them, actually, you do know. What happens to you when you fall and you hurt yourself? Where do you go? Who takes care of you? Everybody knew that they had a family, and within that family they knew who they went to when they had hardships. So the notion that there is something binding a small group of people to deal with hardships was the point of departure. We started with the children, then we asked the women, what do you do when you have a problem? And when the problem is loss of crop, not just an incidental thing. Incidentally, we asked women about loss of crop because in many places in rural India, there is an increasing femininity of agriculture. Men migrate to towns hoping to get better income and more stable income than the agriculture. And agriculture increasingly has become a feminine thing. Women remain behind and take care of the agriculture. Remember that because of traditional laws of ownership, they do not own the land, but they till it. Under Indian insurance laws, you cannot get crop insurance unless you show title to the land. So clearly, the insurance model is useless because by definition it excludes the ones you really want the insurance for. So we created a different model. Did we need IRDA approval? No. 
I met all the chairmen of IRDA, with the exception of the latest, because I was no longer in it. All the others I've met from the very first to the penultimate. And I told them about the model. And they all agreed that we could, in strategic terminology, fly below the radar. In other words, we don't need a permit, because what we do is not business, it is self-help. And women and men are allowed to do self-help. They don't need the permit of the government to do self-help in the village. So that meant that there is no financial interest or financial legitimate interest for an outsider to take money away. Profits have to remain amongst the parties. That, in terminology of a lawyer, is the mutual model, the mutual aid. The moment you are on the mutual aid model, it also means that everybody is both a client and an owner. And that appealed very much to the community. That created a question, who will run the show? You ask about claims, but there is also the running the whole group. Yep. We didn't decide that. We catalyzed the dialogues around themes and the community decided who were the trusted elders who would be entrusted with opening the bank account with two or three signatures. Who were the trusted fair people who would discuss, adjudicate claims. And most important, because there is absolutely no question of going to law, to a court of law when there are disputes, it would cost longer than the claim, it costs more than the claim and lasts such a long time in India that it is not an opening proposition even. We created an ombudsman in each such place, but we created the notion, we didn't designate the person, the community did, and we trained them to do it. As it turned out, in my seven years of actual operation of such micro-insurance schemes in hundreds of villages, there has never been a recourse to the ombudsman. But everybody knew there is one. So there was a sort of a deterrent not to break the rules, because if you did, we had a recourse in the village, cost-free. So the basic structure was to follow what a business proposition of insurance does, but through self-governance and by adaptation to reality. The most important two questions in this are what should be insured and how much will it cost? We're talking about people who are cash poor. Not all of them are poor if you count all the assets and the land and livestock and what else, gold. But they're cash poor. Most of the transactions in daily life are not cash transactions and they don't have cash. So. The other element is that they have their own set of evaluating the benefit differently than simply in dollar terms or in rupee terms. And you cannot have a standard package, which maybe in the WHO we would think is a standard wonderful thing. In the village, it's very different. If the village grows on sugarcane, the most important issue for them is snake bites because you've got about two hours until you get the antiserum or you're dead. So, that's very important. If the village does something else, and snake bite is not the key issue, just to illustrate the uh, totally different thing, fishermen, their biggest problem is if they get injured on the boat, how do they get off the boat to get care? In other words, every group had a different set of prioritized, uh, perceived priorities. We may not agree about those priorities, but that was not the issue. The issue was, what are your perceived highest risks? Now, from that thing, again, by having designed a game, which incidentally is called, in English, we call the choose, Choosing Health Plans All Together, abbreviated to CHAT, and those of you who know Hindi know CHAT played very well in the villages because it had a different meaning there. So. The point was that we use chat to empower people in an iterative simulation to make their, cho their choice of what should be in the package. Now behind the machinery 
we calculated the pure actuarial cost of each of these risks based on information we collected upfront on the frequency and severity of risks locally. So we knew what was the likelihood of such risk and its cost in the local terms. So this is, I'm sorry to interrupt you. But as we're running a little short on time, I just wanted to get in also an investor's perspective to the whole scenario. Uh, so I just wanted uh, probably uh, one of the investors in the audience, you know, to say a few comments about what they feel uh, impact investing and how they about impact investing and how they have looked at it. So any um, investors in the audience, I would love you to be a part of the discussion and probably talk about it. Would, would you like to go? Sure, I'd be happy to talk. So, uh, as a fund, we invest in India and we look at uh, firms that are trying to target the middle income and the, the lower income uh, the consumers in India. So, the way that you think about impact is that automatically, like any firm investing at that like target consumer, is it automatically impact for investment? Is it also for it's just opening it up? Response. So does another investor want to get in on that? Yes. Uh, most of the firms uh, in India, right, are looking for capital, which I think is very wrong. Like uh, we have we have around 22 startups on our board, so we are funding around 22 startups. But 99% uh, of the startups they don't know where the money has to be. Like they come up with, we require one million dollars, we require 0.5 million dollars. But when you ask them a question, okay, I'm giving you on this table now, tell me how are you going to utilize this? So I think the requirement of capital is only 20 percent. The resource investment is very high. So they need to be mentored along with giving the capital. If that is not done, I think the chances of failure are very, very, very high. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I tend to agree with that. So we have some impact investments in our portfolio for my angel network. So the thing with the rural area, we have invested in a company called iCure TechSoft, which is into rural technology. So they have health workers who go with uh, iPads to the last mile. They do the data entry and then they store it in a central system. They started by a bunch of ex-Oracle guys. Now the issue is, Twofold. One is that there are a lot of uh, local issues. For example, there are quacks in the villages who don't allow the doctors to work uh, and they sort of act as a difference. So that's a cultural issue uh, that's prevalent. And secondly, the customer is not very sticky because you have to create a lot of awareness that health is a necessity, it's not an option. So I think those two factors we found at least in this healthcare for the rural area. I think that's uh, across the board that you know this customer stickiness and cultural issues. How do you address this? So what do you mean that? I mean, what I'm getting is that there is uh, money that, of course, you're looking to invest, but you're not sure about the actual impact that is generated from that money. Um, so maybe any of the foundations or beneficiaries of um, you know the kind of money that is out there in the audience. Sir, you said that you were also a foundation. Uh, so would you like to get in on that about your experience? I, I, I just started a foundation. Okay. It's called the Mar Maritime Culture Foundation. Okay. So I have been working on how to create a maritime culture in India. India being a subcontinent, it's got a continental culture, and. Uh, because of my association with the Navy, I, I, I am doing this. So the idea is to get, uh, there are a lot of inland water bodies in India, to get one child from an inland water body to go to sea, either join the Navy or the Merchant Navy. So uh, I am working on how to get them to go to sea, uh, mentor them, guide them, uh, and I have given 5% of my equity as uh, the Co uh, corpus for the foundation. So that is the idea. So I'm just getting started, and that's why we have to get uh, to learn more about how to do go about doing this. So Peter, what would be your take on? Well, well let, let me just share share with you, I guess, um, on how we're doing uh, our, our fund for our, uh, our our foundation. 
So the typical route, as you guys will know, uh, for any investment is you listen to a pitch, the guy wants, uh, let's say, wants 500,000 and he wants 15% for your 5,000 pound If you like the guy, if you like the pitch, it's the investment made, right? So one of the things that I did was to spin it around completely. So what I call reverse funding. And so what we want to do in our fund, um, because we're building five startups from ground zero, um, and we have a tokenized fund on the blockchain. The key thing there is that we want to make everything transparent and traceable all the way through to how that money is being spent by the startups, just not us. But I also want to provide a, if you like, a, um, not, not a, a fully risky, a, a full risk averse uh, um, portfolio, but I want to protect the investors' in, uh, uh, investment in our, in our fund. So what we're saying is that we have a 100 day program that we're going to run. The 100 days program, at the end of that 100 days, a milestone is met by these five startups. We will automatically inject uh, $25,000, and at that point, because they've earned the, that milestone, they've, they've done the milestone, they will earn equity. So we give them equity, okay? Now what they need to do is the next milestone. So for the next two years, there'll be milestones, met milestones. And every time they reach a milestone, we inject money, but we also release equity back to them. So over the two year period, we end up being um, like only a 10% shareholder in the company and they, they, own, they own all of it. Now what that does to the investor is that they realize straight away that, um, that we're not just throwing our money at any startup, just for the sake of it. And they can monitor themselves, they can see exactly where our money's going into what startups, there's five of them, but where those startups' money, how they're utilizing the money, which is the most critical point. So now, because on the blockchain, and it's token based, it's cash tokens, they can redeem at any point up. But you know exactly, for example, where that money's been spent, okay? You know, why is that person, you know, drawing a salary of 90,000 a year, for example, right? And so these questions can be asked. So that's how we're doing it. And we're providing an environment where our fund becomes, you know, quite funky in a way because, you know, there's no dilution to the investors. So these guys here, for example, put money in our fund, they will never be diluted. We get diluted, but that's great because we're the foundation. As long as we've got enough money to run the operation again, that's great. So, so how do you link what you're doing to what you're doing? Well, I, I tell you what's really interesting here, because this is the first time I heard all of this part, I think it's really cool. <laughs> this, this, by the way, is when I say, what is your purpose? That, that's a real cool uh, you know, definition of what the purpose is. So that's really you know, fantastic what you're doing. So for me in this instance now is, so how can I pick up your model? Mm -hmm. And how can I get other communities around the world, or countries around the world, to adapt that? So for me, it's about creating a startup that can pick up this model, okay, and deliver it in other countries at the same time. Colonel, but how do you put capital into his system in order to unleash... Well, I'll be funding the startup. I'll be funding the startup. I'll tell you how. Since we're talking about low capital and not equity, because the community is owned and nobody else can be part of it, so it can only be low, it cannot be equity. That changes the game. So what you need to determine are three basic things. What is the amount of money needed, for how long, and at what interest rate? When you've got these parameters set, you're good to go. What you need is him to set up the fund from which the capital is drawn and to which the payments are repaid, both capital and interest. The moment you've got that, you've got it going. Now, each such unit may be very, uh, the, the, the actual amount of cash needed, capital needed, may be very, very small. To, to illustrate this in real terms, when we, I've done the calculations for India. It's not calibrated for Ethiopia, but for India, we came to, I come to a number, which I published, so it's on record, of $1.65 to bring a person into insurance, as low, one-off only, not every year, a single time. So when you have a next cup of coffee, think about it. You could have one person who is today uninsured actually become a part of an insurance for the rest of their life. So the amount of capital are not very big. But if you told me, here is one sixty-five, $1.65, now bring one person in, I'd say, no, thank you. 
If you said to me, here's $1 million, I'd say, no, thank you. Because there is a critical size below which it doesn't work, it dilutes. If you told me, so if you ask me what today for me would be the ticket size, when I started this, and I didn't know everything I can tell you today, I took grants to do research, and the research was really implementation. And I would take what I got, one million, one and a half, two, three. Today, I refuse any grant because I'm not interested in grants anymore. And my minimum ticket size would be 20 million because I know the effect. I tried, I pitched, I didn't succeed. For 100 million, with which I could have brought in 64 million people. Nobody that I know of in the development community, no government or no any, any agency has been able to do so much with so little money. David, I would like to take that on to probably Patricia as well. So Patricia, in in your field, because I, I read a bit about you know a lot of your work and um, Nitu here as well had you know given me a bit of a background. You're actually, um, you know, you get a lot of funds as well in your foundation, World Life International. So when you think about the impact of that money, uh, how do you utilize the funds that you have? Um, and how would you, I mean, what is your thought process? That would be very interesting for us to probably know. Uh, we, we tackle it from a completely different angle. Mm -hmm. For us, the most important thing is to try to save the most threatened species. So when we're thinking about India, we're thinking about vultures, we're thinking about uh, species of birds and, and, and in general habitats that are extremely threatened and that are impacting the welfare of people and the well-being of people in the future. So right now you have a massive crisis of uh, Asian vultures in India with 95% of the population completely collapsed because of the use of the Klopinac for cattle. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is actually impacting your children. You have 20,000 children dying of rab rabies because of the, of the replacement of vultures with rabbit dogs. So working directly with the vulture population trying to stop the decline, it will actually have an impact on human health in India in the future and in directly in children and, and the poorest of the poor that are actually being mm -hmm. attacked by rabies. So our entry point is nature and nature loss but we look into what is the impact that it has on people because we understand that we cannot save nature just for nature's sake. Nature has to be saved also for human well-being. So our funding is mostly grants. I mean, we don't have, we operate as a non-profit um, and our funding is directed to research but also to implementation of projects that involve people and, and help them uh, improve in their well-being but also improving their income. And Riaz, uh, you know, you've, you've been part of a foundation and you, you play both roles. I think the foundation invests their own money as well in implementing and as well as you raise funds from other sources to implement a few of the projects. So can you just give us a background on that? Yeah. Look, in, in our case, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a two-way approach. When, when we are talking to the government, you know, their the needs to identify by the provincial or local government and we need to we work in synchronization with them in order to get them on board to get the necessary support to get the approvals for let's say for example if you want to do a re oral rehabilitation or we do a health campaign health camps or we do the cataract surgeries or similar side of sort of things another thing is that when it is donor identified so you know they normally come up with some preconceived ideas as to where you would like the application of funds where it's in continuation of their overall mission, overall objectives, where we try and, and then uh, piggyback on our, expand, uh, our experience and then continue and, and perform that. Mm -hmm. And then when it's on our own discretion, then we would rather, rather like to do the, the operations and the activities to reinforce what we are exactly doing now to upscale it so that we can get a bigger, bigger impact. Like for example, we at the moment, the donors, they approached us and they said, okay, in Mozambique uh, is the number one cause of uh, blindness is cataract. So they said, okay, we have funds available, what do you like to do? So we say, okay, we like to save the children, or sorry, we like to save the people from blindness. So in that case, we would like to apply the funds to import the medicines and get the surgeries done with the Mozambique doctors to, to protect people from getting blind. 
So these are the three areas, three ways in which we we do the disbursement and application of funds in our campaigns, in our in our activities. So we had a social enterprise in the audience, I guess. Yes. So sir, can you can you just just tell us being a social enterprise because we have spoken about for profit, spoken about foundations. What is your perspective on this entire uh, ecosystem? Because it's a very it's a very new space to be in, especially in India. Uh, so you know, profit was has, has traditionally been a bad word in the in the social sector or in the philanthropy. You know, especially when we interface with governments, it becomes a bit of a challenge. It was previously a bit of a challenge when we said we are a for-profit social enterprise. But gradually, I think that the understanding of the, of the fact that CSR or any philanthropic activity also needs to be sustainable. And sustainability basically comes from profits. So profits is not a bad word, profiteering is a bad word. So I think you know that classification gradually has now seeped in. And uh, you know, I think for-profit social enterprise, as we see it and we understand, is the order of the day. In fact, we know that there's a lot of the graduation of even the CSR policies in various companies now towards sustainable CSR. So, you know, they, even if they, they spend money to erect a toilet, for example, they do not want that foundation or that organization to come back to them when the faucet breaks or when the tiles are need replacement. So they need that activity to be sustainable because somewhere down the line, their investment gets completely depreciated or eroded. And they value so, you know, as we see it, the way CSR is evolving, Going forward, corporate social responsibility is going to emerge into corporate survival responsibility uh, in a way that companies will get judged by the amount of CSR work they do and that, that will become critical to their survival. So people are going to expect an empathetic uh, angle or aspect of, uh, to every company, to every corporate's functions. And it doesn't matter what they're doing, but it's going to matter if they're not doing anything. So that's how we're seeing it and now. Uh, yes. I think it goes back a little bit to the purpose conversation. Uh, so that what is the purpose? Going back to you know, what Peter said in yes. his opening remarks mm -hmm. is uh, profits need to come last. They're important, mm -hmm. but they're not, they cannot be the keystone of your activity. It's got to be a triple bottom line where every aspect of that triple bottom line is valued as much as profit is. And unless that is there, even the so, uh, social impact investor, I mean, I keep saying this in the light of it, a lot of them come in disguise these days. You know, they call themselves a social impact investor, but they're actually looking for IRRs 36 to 48%, which is basically back breaking as far as the activity is concerned. So, which is what I was saying about is that there now needs to be a completely mindset change in, in the world we're in today when it comes to investing. Yeah. Um, so I guess the guys in the back of the room here, so if you were to say to the guys, hey, look, we've got some yes. really good sustainable uh, startups, okay, that we're building, uh, your return's gonna be between five and seven years, okay, are you interested? The conversation may not be too uh, too long, okay? <laughs> I'm not, not saying, I'm just, I'm just giving you an example. So now, but now what's happening is that because there's more and more startups coming onto the scene, mm -hmm. that they are focusing on the SDGs and sustainability. Yes. Um, the investor in some way is being forced to look at it in a, in a different way. So now they're saying, okay, well maybe we need to start considering impact. We know we're not gonna get a three to five year return, now it's more five to seven years, right. okay? And I think that's gonna adapt to it. I just wanna pick up on, you, you, you mentioned corporate social responsibility. I like the way you put survival, but there's a new, there's a new definition of CSR and it's corporate social innovation. So you can call it corporate social, corporate survival innovation, because that's in essence what we're trying to do, it's the innovation part that we want to, to give back, right? So, you know, so I think innovation is different to, to survival. I mean, end of the day, if you do not innovate, the moment you start moving sideways, you're going to perish. So, you know, I mean, the way we define it internally in our team conversations, I keep saying we have to be like that stone that will keep bouncing on even water till it's moving. So you know, the moment it stops, it sinks. So you know, so innovation is integral, and I think that's inherent to even getting to where one intends to, to do so. So it's just a question of. I just wanted to also get in a perspective. Uh, we have two students sitting with us today, so I just wanted to know you're in a business school, right? 
uh, you have certain aspirations after business school, probably to become entrepreneurs or probably to, you know, be a part of one of the organizations sitting in the room. So how is that a part of what you're learning at business school? Just your perspective. For sure, like if I even now we've been taught this that look we have certain problems that we need to deal with and we're the next generation so if we don't address it we have nothing to give to the generation after us so definitely we do take into account which is why we're sitting here right now because it's very interesting even the business we associate ourselves with we make sure they're to some extent at least eco-friendly we try we're doing our parts and obviously in the future when we join a corporate business, it is a social responsibility that we also have that we make sure that they are being ethical to the environment and to us. Mm -hmm. So this is something we have been taught in business school and we will take it forward. And just adding to her point, you know, I'm not really exactly in the business school, but I'm in the like I'm in the data science part of it. So you know, even like other projects and everything, you know, we are evaluated in a way that you know all the things that we all the projects, the innovation has to be towards the sustainable side. So we have to move in that direction only. You know. So profit is one thing, but of course the solutions and the ideas has to be that we create a sustainable side. Sure, like Mr. Lazu was saying, ninety five percent startups fail and you have to think about sustainability and we we've been taught that in our business that that's more to what we've been taught. So we definitely agree hundred percent. Amazing. Uh, so, I mean, in fact, I guess, Patricia, you would like to uh, maybe say, share a few words on that because environmental sustainability, I guess, is, is a huge topic, but I think a lot of people, even in our personal lives, when we're trying to do our bit for the environment, it, it's so hard. We don't know where to start. So is there a takeaway that you would give uh, to all of us as to what would be a perspective on us? moving forward if we want to make sure that we are looking at the environment? Well, first let me say that it's so refreshing to hear this too because as I was saying, I think that that social awareness about environmental responsibility is already ingrained in their minds and they are the ones who are demanding that the, both the consumers but also the producers in the private sector are taking a more responsible attitude towards environment by mainstreaming it. I would say the only other thing to say, um, and just to finish, is that we all have a responsibility. We all live in one single planet, and we have to remember that all the impact that we're having today with this, yeah. with this, you know, with everything that we're doing is having an impact somewhere else. And that the more that we mainstream it and understand it, that the least, the least we use this, the more conscious we are about the metals that are going into this, the more that we are about uh, conscious about the energy that we're using, the type of food that we're using, the clothing that we're choosing, all those different actions will have a positive impact, not only stopping the negative impact, but having a positive impact to change their future. I have a question to Patricia. So we, we have, we all are really worried about the environment and I think everyone is becoming very conscious, but is it still too little and too late to come to uh, the, the steps that's been taken or the, or the people the waking up with it? Not enough is being done. I think it's definitely too little. I really hope that it's not too late. I mean, uh, working in the conservation world, you cannot think that it's too late because then you just give up. We would have given up a long time ago. <laughs> and, you know, Coming from the conservation world, you have the satisfaction to see that when you give nature a chance, it actually comes back. So I have seen populations which just released vultures in Nepal, and the populations not only that we have stopped the decline is actually starting to recover, and that's what we're hoping that it will happen in India. This is actually possible, and the minute that you start working together, you can see it. And populations, not only of birds, but plants and other animals, and people actually starting to have a much more harmonious way of living with nature. So I don't want to think that it is too late. I think we do have short time. We have to get our act together. We have to work together. We have to remember that it's not the green tree hugger, the green tree huggers that are going to resolve the situation. It's every every one of us. Uh, and that we all have a responsibility and that it is their future and they're demanding it. Can, can I just step just to say that, uh, a couple of things? So um, the World Bank, for example, have no interest in 
um, rural things that are happening around the world. They're interested in the capital cities of the world. So any investment being made is being made in the capital stuff, in the capital cities. So people like, you know, the, the, the real rural people are not seeing anything. The United Nations themselves, politically, internally, they're bickering amongst each other as to who's going to get the pot of money to be seen to be doing good in the world. Um, there's 580 billion being spent or donated in the world by you, me and everyone here, okay? The question is, where does that money go and why have we still got famine, poverty, uh, issues around the world? So these are the things that people have to wake up and, and really adapt to and understand where is it. So that's why, for example, and, and we're just a small piece of something trying to make a, 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 a little bit of a voice in the world with our foundation. That's why we want it on the blockchain. We want you and everyone to know where your money's going because you're entitled to it. But if I said to you today, give me $500, and I'm going to invest it in, you know, uh, in, on an animal, you know, you know for example, uh, donating or sponsoring an animal or sponsoring a child. But you, you can't touch it, you can't see it, you can't feel it. Nobody's going to do it. What's the point? So, so that's, the, that's the problems we have. So I, 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 I agree, into the, I don't think we're too late. Um, there's lots been happening. We can't, we can't go back to it, but we certainly can begin to address it in a different way. But it's a mindset change. And everyone needs to have that mindset change. I just want to make a point about entirely different models. So, um, a few weeks ago, I ordered some mango pickle and poppadoms, popper off Amazon. And I expected them to come from Whole Foods or somewhere. About three weeks later, I got this package through the door with a whole bunch of Indian stamps on it. And it was a handmade jar of pickle and these popper and no branding on it whatsoever. And my first thought was, how on earth has this got through FDA? <laughs> Second point was, how on earth has this got to me? And my third point was, really happy that this, is not a, this was not made by a corporation. This was actually someone in a village that had made these poppard or this pickle, and somehow I'd ordered it and it reached me. When you're talking about CSR, you've then got the absolute opposites of the scale. You've got the world's biggest corporation, Amazon, owned by the world's wealthiest man, and some villager somewhere in India is now taking my dollars and producing papa and pickle for me. And I thought, what an amazing opportunity this is to move the dial. Everyone that is digitally enabled, and India's got a big focus on this, Here's a way of empowering people in a totally different way than ever before. That's really... I'll remember that one. Yeah. <laughs> I'll make so sure I write your name next to it when I quote it. <laughs> <laughs> so that brings us to... Brilliant. That does bring us to the end of our session. Uh, we have the last five minutes, so I would just like the panel to say the last line, uh, concluding line, so starting with Patricia. Well, I think I said my bit. <laughs> I think we all have a responsibility and I think it's fantastic to see these type of topics incorporated in this type of conversations. Yeah. I would say that uh, we should try every day in what way we can, we can help the suffering humanity and uh, whether in terms of thoughts, in terms of our contributions, but to make our world better for those underprivileged uh, and marginalized people in the world. There are many, 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 many. Peter? Yeah, for me, I, I think it's uh, uh, there, there's a definitely a new m mindset change that needs to be done. I think for the, for the, for the, for the young generation over there, I think uh, if you are going to do something, um, you know, make sure there's a purpose to why you want to do it. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess, you know, deliver it in the best way possible. Mm -hmm. um, and from the investment perspective, I mean, I think, it, you know, we are being, I'm an investor too, so I'm being challenged as well from that from that side. So I think uh, we, we're, we live in a great world. Uh, we, and actually, I always say we live in a beautiful world, but we don't know how to live it. That's, I think, our problem. <laughs> so. David. My last thought is this. The issue is not profit. The issue is the conflict between profit taking and profit sharing. The poor or those who consider themselves resource poor are willing to spend money on things they consider important to them. They are not willing to spend money to enrich the ones whom they already consider rich. So the issue is not profit per se, but a fair share of that profit, not just profit taking. The second thought, which relates to the environmental issue and to CSR, 
My own take on that is that we are, for the time being, still satisfied with solutions that deal with the symptoms and not with the causes. And I do not think that CSR or even investments, including what is now so proverbially called impact investments, has reached the maturity that we have reached through a lot of hard work in understanding the needs and how to respond to those needs. The, cap the piece relating to capital needs is just one part of the paradigm. You're right that when capital is delivered, it needs to come with some technical assistance. I agree. But that technical assistance also costs money. And the ones who invest in the capital say, but I am not paying for TA. You do that otherwise. And this is a huge mistake, envisioning the role of capital in the role of development. It's one of three or four major thrusts. And the last, very last point is, the biggest investors in all this are not the ones who give money. It's the ones whose real stake is in the results of decisions taken. Mm. They should not be forgotten. They have to have voice and not just consequences. Thank you, David. And thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you. Thank you.